An ambulance on call. Every second counts. 332 But in this ambulance, those vital seconds are saved by a map. Bravo. This one Bravo. Responding with St. Petersburg. Rescue 6. Reference a subject who's fallen and struck his head on the television. In Pinellas County, Florida, USA, they have the edge on most emergency services thanks to a computer-controlled dispatch system called ETAC. ETAC is a Polynesian word for map, and the system itself is a digital mapping base that is also an automatic vehicle location system. It gives us the ability to pinpoint the exact location of all of our ambulances throughout the county as they move about. The unit we're concerned with now, 332, is down in this area. If I keep zooming in, I begin to see more and more detail of the actual area that they're in to the point where I can actually bring the map up and see very, very specific street locations, cross streets and such. If you don't have a mapping system or you don't have a status system to help keep track of them, um, you can end up sending the wrong unit um, that's not the closest, um, and that could be a real problem for the patient. Now with the ETAG system, all you have to do is push in the address, and it tells you where to go. It directs your unit. You can see it on the screen. You can watch your little arrow turn. If you make a wrong turn, you can, you can follow yourself. 332, responding code 3, 4319, 43, 19, 3rd Avenue North. Cross Street of 44th Street in grid 648 A Alpha. Responding with St. Petersburg Rescue 6, reference a 91-year-old male with chest pains. If I'm just going to point here, the star is where we want to be, the arrow is where we are. We are accountable for our response times under our contract with the county, and for emergency calls, we must meet a 10-minute or less with a 90% reliability. We feel that this technology, by cutting out precious seconds that are clicking by when the dispatcher has to make a decision of which ambulance to send that may be closest, that we are actually going to shorten our response time. So it saves money, saves time, saves lives. Money, time, and lives, the most important thing. Maps are tools. They have a purpose. With ETAC, that purpose is safety. All too often, maps have been tools of exploitation, even destruction. But today, many maps are warning signs with which to tell the future. There's now a spectacular array of information allowing almost every aspect of the world not only to be seen, but assessed. The risks we run, both with ourselves and our Earth, are displayed on maps, and we ignore them at our peril. Even at the everyday level, we make compromises between our convenience and our safety. The approach to Kai Tak Airport, Hong Kong, is one of the most demanding in the world. But we trust the experts. Here are the air crew, the air traffic controllers, and their electronics. We believe they know their way around a now well-charted world. Be it Hong Kong, Sydney, London, or Washington, D.C. Take the aircraft situation display here in Washington. It's remote from the two airports and covers all of continental America. The ASD can, for instance, display the total number of planes in the air for the whole of the U.S. airspace. At this moment, 2,982. Or it can color code each flight by departure point or destination to create a flow chart.
or it can home in on any one airport, say JFK in New York, and plot each and every plane and, if necessary, zoom in on any one of them and identify it by flight number. It can't prevent accidents, but it can and does reduce their likelihood by information display. The more we know, whatever the field, the better equipped we are to respond. In Ecuador, for example, there's a seasonal ceremony known as El Paseo del Niño. El Pase del Niño is a tradition in the region of Azuay that has constituted through the years. The El Niño procession, high in the Andes, is named after the Christ child because it is held around Christmas, an annual celebration of God's bounty in providing the people with the equatorial climate in which sun and rain are happily mixed. In the country, and also in religious terms, families are complete, with conjuntos musical and carros allegorical, traveling through various streets. But ironically, the name El Niño is also given given to a far from bountiful influence on that climate, an occasional ocean current causing high seas, torrential rain and flooding. Along the river in Ecuador's largest city, Guayaquil, the stilt houses are still too low. No one here has forgotten the worst ever El Niño in early 1983. Cuando hubo la corriente del niño que se desbordaban los ríos, no sé qué, el salado, el agua llegó hasta siquiera hasta donde está el carro blanco, el último de allá. Media cuadra. Media cuadra de aquí para allá. Entonces nosotros tuvimos que salir todo lo de estas casitas para allá hasta que pasara porque el agua nos llegaba a la rodilla. La, el agua, el agua donde estaba más hondo llegaba aquí, donde estaba más encima. De ahí la persona el que alcanzaba tierra, si no, se, ahog se ahogaba. Aquí hubo algunos muertos. El Niño and its seasonal floods have arrived for centuries. But only recently have scientists begun to understand what causes a phenomenon that devastates the Ecuadorian economy. The ocean surface is not a static thing. The temperature of the oceans changes with time, in particular down in the tropical Pacific between South America and Australia, Indonesia. The temperature at the ocean surface cycles back and forth every five years or so. It's kind of irregular, not every five years, but every five years or so, the waters off the west coast of South America, which are ordinarily cold, suddenly begin to warm up. Well, it's mostly a new science because now, from satellite and other types of observation, we are capable of mapping on a global scale what is happening over the ocean. Before, we only had very, I mean, a few ships, and we're not able to produce maps, instantaneous maps, as we are now. And we see from these maps that uh, the warming is not a localized warming along the coast of Peru, but is a warming that takes place along the entire, in the entire tropical uh, Pacific. On this map, the ocean temperature is color-coded red for warm, blue for cold, and Central America is on the right. The 1983 El Niño can be seen building up, then crossing the Pacific to the shores of South America. Then the normal pattern is resumed, with the upwelling of cold water carrying food for the fish which abound off Ecuador's coast. The balsa wood boats look ill-suited to the rigors of the Pacific, yet they serve their purpose, except when El Nino strikes. Malo. Pésimo. Pésimo. Ahí no se puede trabajar. No trabajaron nada. Nada. De todo ese tiempo no se trabaja hasta que ya se amansa. No se podía. En veces mucho viento. No se podía. Aquellos días ustedes no conseguían nada de pesca. Se escasea la pesca. In that time, the current of the child, the climate affected by all parts. There were no species to fish. For the first time, there was no fish. Because in reality, it was a disaster. For the studies that the scientists did, they didn't put the current of the child, which is something that affects also a lot. In reality, the climate of the sea. I think the water feels cold or cold, I don't know. Because that's what the scientists do, the studies, of course. 
that something scientific was not only felt on the coast. 50 miles inland, Ecuador's second industry, bananas, literally went under. By the thousand, trees died and workers were laid off. But this industry makes enough money to be able to take precautions. Fue necesario pensar en que para seguir manteniendo las exportaciones de banano, eh, poder seguir consiguiendo presencia en los mercados internacionales con nuestra fruta, era necesario prepararse. Y a partir del año 1984 comenzamos a construir canales y estaciones de bombeo para poder aliviar el peso de las aguas que podían venir en algún momento. No ha vuelto a ocurrir el problema, pero estamos preparados para el futuro. But only so much preparation is possible. The banana industry, like the balsa boat fishermen, can only wait and pray that the next El Niño won't be as severe as in 1983. For scientists can map El Niño, but they cannot yet predict it. But we do not have yet the model that are coupling the atmosphere and the ocean. We are just starting in this area, coupling the two, because this process is the coupling between the atmosphere and the ocean is a very important process in the El Niño. Some of the Earth's mysterious forces may be predicted. The study of earthquake patterns has led certain scientists to make some surprising claims. The question is, is often asked by the lay public is, uh, can we not control or even prevent earthquakes? And, and the fact is that uh, that's worth dreaming about. That is, if earthquakes, as we know, are caused by motions on faults, isn't there something we could do that would cause those faults to slip gradually, or perhaps only to break in certain segments rather than breaking the whole uh, all at once. And I think uh, there are some uh, reasons for optimism on that. And, and there, in that sense, uh, have some earthquake control or maybe, maybe even earthquake prevention. But not yet. And in Salt Lake City, the fire chief faces an immediate threat unimagined by the city's founding father. In uh, July 1847, uh, Brigham Young brought a, a, a band of, of pioneers who belonged to the Mormon Church to the Salt Lake Valley. He saw a lot of open area in the valley with good water supply, uh, with trees, uh, with good soil in, in which to plant the crops. And so um, he felt that this was an ideal um, uh, valley in which to settle. One of the things that Brigham Young could not foresee was that he was bringing his followers into a valley which is very geologically active and seismically active. We're very close to the Wasatch Fault, which is uh, the major fault that runs along the Wasatch Mountains, and it's, it's almost 200 miles in length. Far away in Washington, D.C., the U.S. Geological Survey has made a risk analysis map of Salt Lake City. One of the questions we had was, what would the effect of a major earthquake have on the population within Salt Lake City itself? One of the things we did was look at the transportation patterns. In this map here, we've put in the current road network in a small area within the city and have marked the locations of fire stations here with the white Fs. Now, one of the things we can do is combine with that some geologic information. In this case, we are looking at a hazards map, which shows that in the eastern part of this map that the hazard uh, during an earthquake is fairly minor. In the western portion, in the yellows and oranges, the hazard is significant. Combining this information then with the transportation that we had in the past shows us a new model showing that in the northwest portion of the map, you could not reach those areas within 10 minutes. What this is useful for is planning the locations of new fire stations, and in the event of an earthquake, how you may be able to get to particular populations at risk. Mapping what's happening invisibly is now commonplace. 
and the frontiers are being extended all the time. One of the new technologies in trying to understand, for example, what is underneath these mountains uh, that's, that's causing earthquakes is to use tomographic techniques. That is the same technique that is used in CAT scans for, for brain scans, where you develop a three-dimensional image of, of the subterranean structure by using lots and thousands and thousands of individual earthquakes with their waves coming through this area. So seismic tomography is an area that, uh, that's very exciting right at the moment. It has long been the ambition of medical science to map the living human brain. X-rays showing bone have helped in cases of skull fracture. But for inside the brain, and indeed the rest of the body, the breakthrough came with harnessing a massive superconductor to yield what's called magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI. It offers uh, a very safe way of, of visualising a patient, and so therefore it's very good for using for patients like children or people who are going to have repeat examinations. And also because of the soft tissue contrast, you can see far more detail on certain pathologies than you can on ordinary x-rays. Inserted into the heart of the magnet, the organ under scrutiny is visually sliced, like a loaf, but in three directions, top to bottom, front to back, and side to side. The result? a three-dimensional map of the brain. You can see the inside of the brain and you can see the ventricular system that's inside the patient's brain. That would be very difficult to be seen with conventional x-rays. As you come farther through the patient, this is the patient's eyeball here and the muscles of the eyeball shown here. This is a cross-sectional picture seen in the other direction. So on this image you can see the patient's ears here. And as you come further through the image, you will then see the sinuses in the front of the patient's head and the orbits being demonstrated. Finally, processed on a computer, the 3D brain slices can be manipulated by the physician into any plane required for diagnosis. In the 19th century, the mapping of disease was a brand new science. In 1854, London suffered a cholera epidemic centered on Soho. By plotting the deaths as little black coffins on a map, a local doctor, John Snow, discovered that around Broad Street, the death rate was highest. Snow believed, controversially, that cholera was waterborne. He shut down the Broad Street pump and the plague abated. John Snow was the first epidemiologist to use mapping of small neighborhoods to try and learn something about the dynamics of a, of a disease and an epidemic. Now, the application of that work uh, here in the Bronx has meant the identification of specific neighborhoods in which the AIDS risk is very great. Ernie Drucker believes that AIDS could kill half the local population unless people understand exactly how it spreads in different neighborhoods. New York City. It does not have a single AIDS epidemic. In fact, the world doesn't have a single AIDS epidemic. It has many epidemics that come together in various ways. For New York, the most important difference in the two epidemics that we have is between gay men and drug users. And the maps, once again, show this very dramatically. There's a map which shows uh, the AIDS epidemic uh, among gay men in New York, the areas with the highest rates among gay men. Uh, and those areas are uh, distinct and different from the ones uh, for IV drug users. They're two different maps in New York City. They have almost no overlap. And that has a lot to do with the residential characteristics of the city. The gay population is more affluent and better educated and live in the better areas of the city. The drug users concentrate in the poor areas of the city. The rich people that got money, they don't have to go through that process of that. If they want to go shoot, they just buy a whole box of needles and they got them. Poor neighborhoods seem to have a higher rate. Yeah. According like, to the income. It's like, yeah, like one in 50 women in New York is yeah. supposed to have AIDS. Within well, the South Bronx, low economic structure, right. it's like one in 30. The spires of midtown Manhattan can just be seen from the South Bronx, but they are a whole world away. Despite all the efforts to regenerate the area, 
there still remains a seedier side, given over to prostitution and drug dealing in burnt out buildings and shooting galleries. Under the L, the railway that connects the South Bronx to the world, Ernie Drucker has his clinic. And it's in deprived neighborhoods like this that AIDS has mushroomed. There's a series of maps that we have which uh, uh, center on this neighborhood. And they're maps of the Bronx and the hospitalizations of AIDS in the Bronx over time. As you look at those maps from 1981, when the first AIDS cases appeared, uh, in 82, you see about a dozen cases in the Bronx in that year. And each year, we simply went ahead and put the new cases on the same map. So the map grew over time. And by the fourth year, 1986, uh, you begin to see a concentration of AIDS cases in this community that is truly phenomenal. You know, it's been said that geography is destiny. And for a woman born in this community, having a normal sexual life is enormous risk that in the course of her sexual life, let's say 10 years in which she could easily have five or 10 partners, we wouldn't consider that to be uh, unusual in any part of the world, uh, that one or two of those partners are likely to be infected. So the chance of her acquiring the infection and in turn passing it on to her sexual partners and to newborns is very great indeed. Hey, hey, hey you! Lynn Pinter Valley works with Drucker. Hers is a vital hey, role. Hey to assess the level of knowledge on the streets and spread the information gleaned from Drucker's maps. Do you know what you know about how AIDS, AIDS is transmitted? It's transmitted through sex and through needles. I mean, if you want to be nasty, you be nasty. If you want to be cool, then you be cool. That's cool. To protect yourself. Cool, protect yourself. You better use them condo. For real, that's no, that's no bull. Because most of the time, you won't find a guy that'll say, well, look, I got it, you know? Let's not. Let's take precautions. Once they got it, they feel like they feel so miserable that they just don't care for life because they know they're going to lose it anyway, so they don't take the moment to prize their own life or prize anybody else's life. Some of your friends having sex already? Yeah, almost all my friends are pregnant. You're going to be careful, right? You live in the yeah. neighborhood, I'm going to be watching you. I'm going to watch that you're careful. The word about AIDS and the possibility of preventing it really hasn't reached here in some important ways. In all our travels today, you, you're yet to see a sign about AIDS. I don't know if you notice that as you go around. There's not a poster anywhere. There's not a uh, obvious kind of advertising campaign. Everything else is advertised. Liquor, cigarettes, records, music stations, McDonald's, but nothing about AIDS. <clears throat> Fully 50% of this population is in danger of being wiped out by the AIDS epidemic in the next 15 years. And that's not an exaggeration. It really is genocidal in its implications. The terrifying threat of AIDS in areas like this can be seen as a symbol of the ecological epidemic the whole world faces today. There is no simple solution. But the more we can map present problems and future disasters, the better chance we stand. The engines are on. Four, three, two, one, zero. We have commit. We have. We have lift off. Lift off at 7:51 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We have cleared the top. December 21st, 1968. The astronauts aboard Apollo 8 were the first human beings to see the shape of the world with their own eyes. They also saw the world for what it is, a small body in infinite space. When you see it about the size of your fist out at, uh, at the end of your arm, and you see it, and this was at Christmas time, uh, and so it reminded me of a very beautiful and fragile Christmas tree ornament. It brings home that indeed the Earth is, is very beautiful, uh, it brings home the fact that it's very fragile, we need to treat it with care, and it also is quite finite. That finite fragility now stands revealed to all of us. Green issues are taken seriously, even by advertisers. Global warming, the greenhouse effect, the ozone hole are the buzzwords of today. Only by recording what has happened and is happening, and on that information making models of the future, can we predict and take essential precautions. If the world is a gaming board, 
and the future is the stake we're playing for, then our trump cards are maps. As we move into the 1990s, the odds are changing. We're loading the climatic dice. As we go farther into the 21st century, let's say by the middle of the 21st century, we expect that the globe as a whole will have warmed up by anywhere from two degrees to five degrees Celsius. Let's call it four degrees to nine degrees Fahrenheit. That does not seem like a very large temperature change to the average person, but what you have to remember is that during our last ice age, 18,000 years ago, the globe as a whole was only five degrees Celsius, nine degrees Fahrenheit, colder than it is today. So we are talking about a climate change happening within our lifetimes that is every bit as large in magnitude as the difference between the last ice age and today. And that is a major climate change by anyone's estimation. One immediate consequence of that warming will be a rise in sea level over the next 50 years. Even in the most cautious predictions, the Nile Delta, much of Bangladesh, and many Pacific islands are under threat. So too in the United States are Sacramento, Chesapeake Bay, and the coast along the Gulf of Mexico. Just south of New Orleans lies the sand spit of Grand Isle. Here in Grand Isle, Louisiana, we're faced with two sets of uh, problems. One, the long range, and the other is the short term. On the long range basis, of course, we're faced with the problem of global warming. The other, of course, is the enormous rate of coastal erosion that Grand Isle is experiencing. Uh, in this very place that I'm standing, some four years ago, there was exactly 425 feet of property from here to the coastline. Today, we're faced with the immediate problem of this tiny motel being ready to fall into the Gulf of Mexico. My name's Henrietta Collins, and I own the Water Edge. And just last year, we had grass and sand here and a levee, and it's all been washed away. <laughs> I'm going to leave. <laughs> I'm not staying. <laughs> there won't be nothing when we come back. Grand Isle is the only inhabited barrier island along Louisiana's beautiful 8,000 miles of winding coastline. And um, we've been inhabited here for a little over 200 years. Our population here of 2,000, all white, and uh, uh, predominantly Cajun. We're a French-speaking people, and, and most of our population had to go to school to learn how to talk English. And so there's a very deep pride in, in the Cajun heritage. I would say 40% of the, the people down here is in the shrimp and, you know, or have something to do with it. Most of the people down here, yeah, are fishermen, you know. What if Grand Isle were to go under? Well, we'd lose a lot, I can tell you that. Well, it's my home. It's been my home all my life. And when it's gone, I don't know where we're going to go. And it's eventually going to be gone. I, I figure myself that a couple storms like it's in the Gulf right now, another 30 years, it, it won't be no more grand out. The storm is located at 23.3, 93.4, moving north at 8 miles per hour. The highest sustained wind is 65 miles per hour. It's expected to move north in the next 24 hours. As of yet, no warnings have been... On top of their permanent problems, Grand Isle faces the intermittent threat of the hurricanes that occur with increasing frequency. I've just received an official bulletin from the National Weather Service, and they tell me that there is a tropical depression that's about 600 miles to our southwest. We're in the path of it, so we may be having to evacuate Grand Isle once again. This is Bobby Santney. And Bobby is my civil defense, defense director here for Grand Isle. And I call him Ironsides because during the time of uh, evacuations last year, he's proven to be a man of iron. 
and uh, my right-hand man and uh, a native of Grand Isle all of his life. Bob, what, what, what uh, you think is going to be the effects of happen what's happening out there? What's developing? Well, we're going to get some water for sure. That thing's moving eight miles an hour. It's going to pick up, you know, 65 miles an hour with gusts to 73. This is Roscoe based on the Grand Isle Chief of Police, and it's very important that he keeps abreast of everything that's going on uh, in this time of emergency. Chief, what we have here is that the, um, the tropical storm is situated in this position. The projected course is that it's going to take a northeast trend headed toward Grand Isle and toward the mouth of the Mississippi River. If this front would move faster than what it is now, this thing would probably take more of a northeast turn and, and, and maybe miss us, but the way it's going right now, we're going to be right, right in the path. Sending a story, a local TV station put in an appearance. What could happen in a Category 5 hurricane, if it would ever come up this way, which is your strongest storm, it could literally wipe this island out. I mean, it would, the storm surge would just, just take this complete island out of here. And this is why we usually have this concern when we come down here to do this kind of story as to what preparations are being made and how serious these folks are about getting out of here in the event that storm comes this way. Stand up close, take one in five, four, three, two, one. Although Jerry is still days away from making landfall, residents and officials here are keeping tuned to their televisions and radios. Considering Hugo... This time, Grand Isle got a reprieve. The hurricane never arrived. But sooner or later, if erosion and sea level rise don't claim it first, a hurricane will sink Grand Isle. Just as automobiles run on gasoline as their fuel, hurricanes run on warm ocean waters as their fuel. As the climate warms up, we expect the hurricanes to get stronger. And one projection suggests that the destructive potential of hurricanes by the middle of next century should be something like 40 to 50 percent higher than the maximum destructive potential today. We could get something like 220 mile per hour peak winds in the strongest hurricanes. Freak weather is becoming the norm. From the last decade, the hottest on record, consider one year, 1988. In Europe, the alpine ski slopes stayed relentlessly green, and spring flowers bloomed in January. In Alaska, the temperature dropped to a record minus 50 degrees centigrade. In Melbourne, Australia, it was 50 degrees above. The water level in the Mississippi dropped alarmingly, and in Texas, the cattle ate cactus, not corn. Up in the Midwest grain belt, the farmers prayed for rain, and the Indians danced for it. It worked, but in Bangladesh, a nation always under threat, it experienced its worst floods ever. The elements were just not behaving themselves. Too much here, not enough there, and then, it was called one of the worst forest fires in a hundred years. This summer, Wyoming's Yellowstone National Park burned out of control. Extreme heat, low rainfall, and powerful winds fueled fires that eventually swept over a third of the park. Mapping the Yellowstone emergency would be a two-tiered project, assessing the long-term effects and, more immediately, fighting the fires themselves. We got involved, uh, actually, the, towards the end of the fires, actually when they were at their peak, uh, with a call from the Park Service and the Forest Service asking for us to support some infrared uh, surveillance of the park, actually trying to map the fires. So we deployed two aircraft, the NASA C-130, with thermal detection equipment on board to get at where the hotspots were and how fast the fires were moving. The hotspots analyzed by infrared photography were plotted on a map for firefighters to use. Hot areas appeared dark, cold areas white. NASA also called upon their high-flying ER-2. The nice thing about the ER-2, it affords us the opportunity to cover the entire park in about an hour and a half. We brought down imagery onto a display screen in the office such that we could map in real time as the aircraft flew over. 
it's not possible to see flames or fire fronts on this from this altitude and with the, the heavy smoke on the ground. So it is necessary to go to the infrared to see what's actively burning. The uh, fire front becomes immediately apparent. The uh, yellow and orange areas are what is already burned. Uh, these the purplish appearing areas, dense lodgepole pine, as yet to burn. Guided by the maps, the firefighters won. Just. It could have been worse. Only one third of the park, or three quarters of a million acres, burned. There were even some positive results, lessons to be learned for the future, and conveniently on American scientists' doorstep. The park became a hive of activity as remote sensing mappers and down-to-earth rangers weighed up the pros and cons for Yellowstone of the burn of 88. We're currently working there, uh, again using Yellowstone as a laboratory for a very intense fire. And we're looking at things like regeneration. How has fire intensity affected regeneration within the park? Well, from a nature standpoint, there's neither good nor bad. A, an unburned forest is good for some species, and a, a burned forest is good for uh, different species. This is certainly nothing new to this forest. This has burned many times since uh, the forest grew after the ice left following the ice age. And the lodgepole pine has a cone that does not open until it's until it's heated by the flames. Those seeds have germinated and come up, and they are scattered all over the forest here. Uh, in about five years, they'll be uh, maybe knee high. In 10 years, they'll be shoulder high. Uh, and then they'll begin growing about a foot a year uh, in this particular environment. So Yellowstone, renowned nature reserve and beauty spot, will survive, scarred, but not beyond recovery. Yellowstone was not the end of the story. Ripples were felt far beyond Wyoming. We know that there's lots of nitrogen and carbon compounds produced. The greenhouse effect. We know that fire has a major influence on the warming of the environment. Uh, so NASA is involved in using their tools, primarily satellites and aircraft, to look at monitoring and mapping these types of events, not only on a local scale like Yellowstone or a regional scale like Western US, but also on a global scale. The deforestation of Yellowstone was not intentional. In the tropical rainforests, it is. Both contribute to the greenhouse effect and global warming, and the writing is there on the screen. Brazil is the victim of conflicting aims in recent mapping. The computer maps of today chart the dire consequences of deforestation, as here where two rivers meet. The paper maps of the 1970s enabled the Brazilian government to open up the Amazon with the Radam project. They were the first comprehensive maps of the whole region, but were they tools of destruction or an heroic achievement? This is the meaning of the occupation of the Amazon, based on Radam, starting from the discovery of a new world through technology. Radar discovers the Amazon. O Radam foi um projeto técnico, não político. O objetivo dele era revelar as potencialidades da Amazônia, as vocações naturais para mineração, agricultura, pecuária, silvicultura, todas as outras atividades inerentes a um desenvolvimento regional, certo? Então, esse foi o objetivo do Radan. O Radan não tinha como objetivo impor uma política e sim revelar dados e informações. Everybody now knows that the, the Brazil is having great introspective problems. Um, on uh, uh, solving, solving situations which were not brought about by these maps, but which, which were facilitated and made easier and quicker. Trees were felled, their place soon taken by cattle or crops. But the Radam maps sowed more than simply agricultural seeds, as actress turned entrepreneur Susana Gonçalves discovered. A fazenda foi a primeira coisa que eu mexi aqui. 
Mas há uns cinco anos atrás, é, abriu aqui em Rondônia o garimpo de ouro, que era um garimpo não explorado, né? até então não explorado. E de lá para cá, eu tenho me dedicado praticamente que 80% à atividade de extração. Agora, há pouco tempo também, em Ariquemes, a Cacerita está é, sendo desenvolvida agora como um garimpo mecanizado. E é uma área muito próspera, muito, 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 muito rica. Bom futuro, or good future, as the tin mine is called, is one of the many now all too familiar scars on the Brazilian rainforests. It's a free for all. One man band prospectors, panning as in the California gold rush, compete with heavy machinery. The end product, sooner or later, is this. Cassiterite, or tin crystals. And everything that is not tin is washed away. A river used to run through this once jungle area. Now it's a glutinous, silted up morass. A town has mushroomed here. Bars and banks, hotels and whores. Endemic malaria and money. For many Brazilians, Bon Futuro is a lifeline. Bon Futuro era uma, uma, uma selva, né? Era uma, essa vegetação verde, tudo fechado, mas com a descoberta do minério, se tornou o que vocês estão vendo aí. É uma cidade totalmente aberta, né? E aí a gente se dá bem aqui. É uma cidade que a gente trabalha e tira o dinheiro para o nosso sustento. Despite the inevitable clearing of the forest and silting of the river, Bom Futuro is, relatively, contained. And this tin mine provides a livelihood for up to 20,000 people. The same area, stripped of its jungle and given over to agriculture, would not even support a hundred. A sorry end to the Radam Road of good intentions. Mas hoje em dia é a atividade que me dá retorno, que me dá sucesso, é a exploração, que a terra, os custos para tocar uma fazenda, uma fazenda hoje em dia mais para mim é um hobby, porque é impossível viver com, com a renda de uma fazenda. Ora, eu vim para cá porque para possuir mais terra, né? Que eu tinha pouca terra no Paraná, então eu vim para cá, né? Arnaldo Dalle, like a million or more resettled peasants, lives off BR-364, the one artery for thousands of miles. The surrounding countryside is veined with dirt tracks leading to plot after 500-acre plot, like Arnaldo's. They grow cash crops, coffee, rubber, and in Arnaldo's case, cocoa. But lacking the magic wand of money in Susanna's hands, Arnaldo is struggling. The soil is poor, and fertilizers cost more than the crop itself produces in cash. Ah, se, se continuar essa crise do jeito que te, temos hoje, eu creio que vai ser cada, cada vez mais o abandono da, da agricultura. Né? É o seguinte, né? a inflação é grande. Né? Os, os outros artigos que nós compremos sobem sobe mil a 1.500% no ano e o nosso produto sobe 200, 300%. Apenas, né? Então, já há muitos anos atrás, nós vemos... Nesse, né? Se vai continuar mais um ano ou dois fazer essa, essa, essa jogada, nós vamos aperear aqui e vamos ter que sumir, né? Porque não tem comissão, né? There is a double tragic irony here. The Radam maps have led Arnoldo up a dead end. And the decade of destruction he and millions like him have imposed on the Amazon is also a road to nowhere. Not only will the land not support Arnoldo, it will not regenerate itself, even as rainforest. Satellite maps tell the story, but who's listening? Until the uh, modernized countries find a way to replace this type of land use, uh, I don't see a lot of changes happening, at least in the near term. 
as far as trying to stop or slow down that particular land use practice within Brazil and really within the tropical uh, environmental belt throughout the globe. Global problems demand global solutions at the poles as on the equator. Antarctica has only recently been appreciated as a nerve center of the environment, principally due to the publicity created by this map of the largest ever ozone hole over the world's last surviving wilderness. But really for mankind, the Antarctic has more than uh, representing this, this last unspoilt fastness in the, in the south. The Antarctic is very important and has in become increasingly recognized as being important to the life support systems of our planet. And what we can do is to utilize the unique laboratory conditions in the Antarctic to answer questions of global relevance. We're at the edge of really beginning to understand how this huge ice mass plays a controlling role in sea level and how it is coupled with the atmosphere in a complex and most challenging scientific way. Scientists the world over are well aware of the pressing need to understand more about how the Earth works as a living organism. Antarctica is not in isolation. Mapping the ozone hole put Antarctica into the headlines. So will world maps create the same weight of public pressure? Desertification, air pollution, ozone holes, we hear it every day in the newspapers. So our effort was to try to do a map which shows risk for the future in a predictive way. So what we were trying to do was to give an understanding that this is a very fragile earth that we live on and that we must take care of it and we must assess the dangers, the risks, and come up with solutions to those problems that will face us in the future. There is one major international effort on the launch pad called Mission to Planet Earth, it will, if sufficient funding gets it off the ground, bombard scientists with satellite data. The amount of data that we'll get from this project in some ways is overwhelming. It's, it's, uh, it's 10,000 terabytes, and a terabyte is uh, some thousand billion bytes of information. And in fact, in, in just a few days, we'll accumulate much more data than has been collected on the Earth in all the times we've been making measurements with satellites and other, and other, other means. At this point, we don't really have the capabilities to deal with that. I believe that we are making progress in coming up with the types of hardware and software we need to handle the flow of data. I'm less optimistic that we are developing the manpower that is needed to actually analyze this data and convert it into useful information. That remains to be seen. People who say this is too much, too late, I mean, you have to ask, what's the alternative? Uh, we are in the business these days of affecting our global environment. I mean, the amount of CO2 increase in the atmosphere, methane increase in the atmosphere, deforestation, desertification, ozone depletion. I mean, these are real problems. They're not things that people just imagine might happen. They are happening. And now the question is, what's the consequence? And there is a, there is a urgency to this pro project to be able to determine that consequence as soon as we can so that people can make sound policy decisions to avoid what could be very detrimental uh, consequences. Our vision of the world, once partial and intimate, is now total and public. We have revealed the shape of the world. Now we will determine the shape of its future. So if there's any good news at all, it's that nature in the past few years seems to be giving us a peek at what's ahead for us, and maybe that is enough to finally spur us into action in the 1990s so that the types of things we're beginning to see still infrequently now won't become the norm as we go into the 21st century. But it's up to us, of course, to respond to the clues that nature is providing us with.